So, uh, welcome back after the lunch. It's uh, such a pleasure to have so many interested and active participants at our fourth workshop this year. And I'll just uh, wait a little bit um, while people still file back in from lunch. Um, one of the aims of our workshop is that it's interactive. I think it's a great opportunity that we have people from such different backgrounds together in one room and that we can learn from each other. Uh, one of the key words that has been mentioned a few times today is communication. That's exactly what we do. We want to enable communication. We, want, we do communication ourselves. We provide facts that you can form your own opinion. Um, and, and so it's, it's important to leave the time for the networking and for the dialogue, even if that means that we're a little bit behind schedule. Okay, good. With that, I think, yeah, here are my slides now. So I would like to introduce the afternoon session, which will be focused on another new challenge. So apart from all the challenges we were talking about in the morning, um, we're also going to talk about the circular economy. And we have six speakers from very different backgrounds who will share their perspectives on how they see the challenges for having a safe, functioning circular economy with food contact materials, food packaging materials. So let me just start off by talking about chemicals in food contact materials. And the previous speakers have made it really easy for me to do this. Um, a lot of speakers mentioned in the morning that there's a challenge with the number of chemicals. So we have a large number, over 6,000, uh, I'm not going to give any details uh, because I can't, but let's say there's more than 6,000 chemicals that we use in the manufacture of food packaging and other food contact articles. Now, um, what our work at the Food Packaging Forum has shown is that there are several chemicals of concern which are allowed to be used, which are being used in the manufacture of food contact materials. And these are chemicals of concern because they possess certain hazard properties, which Thomas highlighted so nicely in his presentation um, this morning about the substitution. So these are uh, carcinogenic, mutagenic, uh, persistent, bioaccumulating chemicals. They can be endocrine disruptors and so on. It's, it's just a list um, of different hazard properties. Um, we published this work two years ago. We're presently working on a follow-up uh, where we actually are looking at um, the migration of these chemicals. So are these chemicals really uh, an issue for consumer exposure? And right now what I can say, preliminary um, pre-publication of this work, is that some are not, we don't find any evidence for migration, but for some of them, yes, we do find evidence for migration. So it's not sufficient to say there's no exposure to these chemicals. Now, apart from that, we have a whole host of uh, additional challenges. And um, as we, we heard again this morning, the way we assess the chemical safety is we look at um, a, a basic principle of toxicology, uh, which is, in a way, the dose makes the poison. And that's what this equation here shows you. So the, the, the risk of a chemical to cause um, health uh, problems in people depends both on the levels that people are exposed to that chemical, so that's the exposure term, but it also depends on the hazard properties of that chemical. And you can argue about how you want to uh, write this equation, um, which we have, Thomas, in the past, but the, the key message here is your risk is high if either your exposure to a chemical is high, or if the chemical's hazard is high, or both. That's when you get a high risk. Now, this sounds very simple. In real life, we have a number of challenges. I'm not going to go into any details here, but it starts with what Gregor was mentioning. What's the identity of the chemical that we're actually looking at? What's the chemical structure? Um, how do we assess the migration? What do we need for assessing the migration? Well, we need an analytical method. 
How do we get analytical methods? We need to have a calibrant. We need a chemical standard to do that. So that's the whole challenge uh, related to the exposure term of our risk assessment um, approach here. Then, of course, we have challenges to the hazard side, which is, as Tom showed, what are the toxicological endpoints that we're actually looking at? Should we be looking at uterotrophic um, uh, growth? Should we be looking at brain uh, changes? Uh, should we look on the molecular level and so on? Um, also, um, what, what, you know, the uncertainty factors that we use when we go from animal or even cell-based test systems to human exposure, there's a lot of uh, discussion about that on the science, and then not to mention non-monotonic dose response, mixture toxicity, cumulative exposures, sensitive windows of development, and so on. So you see, just in one short sentence, a lot of challenges when it comes to assessing the safety of chemicals and food contact materials. Okay, now, we're looking at the circular economy. Circular economy is another added level of challenge. Um, what is the circular economy? It's basically a principle, a new way of doing business. A circular economy lends itself or lends principles from nature. In nature, we don't have waste. Nature has closed material cycles. We have the nitrogen cycle, we have the carbon cycle, we have water cycles, and, and that's what circular economy is trying to do. It's trying to model an economic system based on the principles of nature. Um, main principles being reduced input of resources, reduced output, reduced loss of energy. Uh, where does the uh, circular economy concept come from? And this is just very, very briefly, you can go back through the slides in detail. Um, I think, we can argue about it, but I think it, it probably starts with the Club of Rome report back in the 70s, the limits of growth. Um, then there were some ideas on industrial ecology that came up. Everyone knows the Sustainable Development Report, United Nations, also known as Our Common Future, or the Brundtland Report, which kind of sets the stage for discussion on sustainable development. Um, how do we do business in, in a way that doesn't destroy the natural resources, um, that, that doesn't yeah, destroy mankind and all other species on this planet? Um, the term circular economy, I was trying to find out where that actually comes from. I think it's from this paper written by two uh, British, UK economists. They're, I think they were the first ones to bring up the term of circular economy. Um, and then, of course, we all know the, the principles of green chemistry, which feed into the concept of circular economy. We know cradle to cradle. Um, planetary boundaries, some of you may not have heard of this. This is a really interesting concept, um, and I, I urge you to go and have a look at it. It's, it's a very pragmatic approach, how to live within the means of our planet, that's hence the name, Planetary Boundaries. And then, of course, the work of Alan MacArthur Foundation, I should mention here, and the European Commission, who, in uh, the framework of its Europe 2020 strategy, came up with a keynote flagship initiative on a resource-efficient uh, economy, and that's where the circular economy term shows up in the policy context, in the European policy context. What changes in the circular economy? What's new about the circular economy? Well, I think, it's, in a way, it's a radical new concept because what the circular economy wants to do is it wants to decouple economic growth from resource consumption, and, and notably from fossil carbon consumption. That's one of the aims of the circular economy. Um, it's about collaborative consumption. So we, we have a whole new approach to products. We have access to products rather than ownership of products. Um, we have uh, uh, repair, reuse, remanufacture. We have increased recycling rates. And we have non-toxic material cycles. That's also one of the principles of the circular economy. And that's one of the things that will affect us when we talk about chemicals and, and food packaging here today. Now, what do I see as the specific challenges uh, for uh, the chemical safety of food contact materials in the circular economy? Um, of course, recycling. I think that is the elephant in the room, and we will hear a lot about this. 
uh, in the following discussions. Um, a challenge to separate food grade packaging materials from non-food grade packaging materials. Um, the recycling processes have to be designed in such a way that they will remove hazardous substances. Um, that is a challenge uh, which, for example, for paper and board, um, right now is, is difficult to meet. Um, and that's why it was mentioned earlier today already, but in Switzerland, for example, we don't allow recycled paperboard in direct food contact for that reason, because we cannot ensure the safety. And there you see, you have a clash of interests here. On the one hand, we want to recycle, we need to recycle, we can't cut off the trees, I think that's what Joanna said, cut all the trees to have fresh fiber. On the other hand, we don't want to poison people, or make them sick, chronically uh, poisoned. Um, so that's, that's one of the challenges. And then, also, one point I want to put up here, how does recycling change the chemical composition of a material? That may affect what substances are leaching from the material in, in the long run. Another issue which is um, very closely related to circular economy, we want reuse, uh, remanufacture of, of products, and so people will get creative. We need to educate people that some products, some containers, are not food grade. Um, and this is a discussion that we've heard in the past, for example, when it comes to these polystyrene ice cream containers. People use those to store their uh, tomato sauce in it. They put it in the microwave in these containers. These containers are not made for that use. But how do you educate people that get creative, that don't want to throw away, that want to reuse? I think that's a huge challenge that we face here. And then, Finally, if the machine will let me click. Good, chemical safety assessment. Um, we will have to decide on whether we are taking a risk-based or hazard-based approach uh, for, in terms of chemical safety assessment, food contact materials in the circular economy. And I'm not sure, Thomas, if we can do that on a case-by-case -case approach in this context, because when we have materials that are out there that are being used, then we may not anticipate the future use in the next 20 or 30 years. And, and so we, we cannot guarantee that risk management approaches will work for that use. Okay, so with that, I would like to leave it and I'm very happy to hear the next presentations. And um, Great. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>